Welcome to the one within all to another episode of the Interverse podcast. We've got everybody's uh, favorite heathen wizard alchemist here, Benjamin Balderson, who I may often refer to as Baldy. <laughs> and we've got Rachel Maiden here, uh, previously appearing on Interverse under the moniker Rachel Muno- M- Munoz. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all right. I can say maybe you don't even know that name and, anymore. Uh, she's uh, like me, recently married to a random stranger from the internet and loving it. And also, you know, to really properly introduce Rachel, she's the what I would call poetic priestess of all things paganism, uh, just beautifying the world with words and with uh, paint and with, you know, all of the above. She's an incredible artist. She's got her own Telegram channel called Suns or Refinery. Yes, Refinery. <laughs> and that's linked in the show notes as well. Also, her Odyssey channel is there. Uh, definitely get into her Telegram channel, though, if you like what Rachel talks about tonight, because she does a great job hosting community events and in- inspiring all of us with her many uh, diverse and unexpected creations, like that fun uh, library within a library I saw. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I didn't say a lot about Balderson. I mean, the dude's the top alchemist that I know in terms of actually making things in the lab and, you know, comprehending the correlation of the philosophy in the lab with the fractal of nature. We've had some incredible episodes in the past with this guy. Go check it out in the archives. And yeah, tonight the topic at hand is called the Havamal. The sayings or the words of the high one. This is a poem attributed to, and maybe uh, maybe it's many poems cobbled together, but basically the words of Odin are captured in poetry that help us understand what the general morality was amongst the uh, Old Norse religion. And, you know, probably these two who have talked about it at length on Odin and Odin's Alchemy, Balderson's YouTube channel and Rockfin channel. I think they're up to eight episodes on 160 lines of poetry called the Havamal. There are different translations. There are different ways of looking at every little line. So, you know, it's deep and uh, I'll let them introduce it. But if you like this and you want the deep dive, definitely go check out Odin's Alchemy on YouTube where they've been collaborating on this for a while. And yeah, just before we jump in, I want to say also uh, my intention in this show is you know, we, what we've done in, in many, many, many episodes of late is dive deep into the syncretism between systems from around the world, looking at etymology, showing how there seems to be some sort of original civilization that gave the uh, general outline of the constellations to different peoples who then took that and ran with it, considering it a scripture in the stars that they translated into the, uh, you know, allegories and metaphors that fit their own languages and fit their own ways of life. And in doing so, you're syncretizing all that. Sometimes you lose a little bit of the baby with the bathwater, if you will. And what I want to do tonight is really capture the uniqueness and the spirit and the, you know, the positive and moral aspects of this old Norse culture that comes through the words of uh, Odin in the Havamal. I think we're going to have a really good time thinking about how our ancestors used to live. So I got all that mouthful done. Welcome, Balderson. Welcome, Rachel. Thanks for being here tonight, guys. Hail, Chance. So, you know, maybe you guys should take it away. If there's anything you want to introduce to the people about this or that you want them to know about you have going on, plug your stuff or, you know, take it away, guys. Oh, you know, we're still going through the Hava Mall. (laughs) (laughs) We got to uh, what seemed like the final stretch and realized that it was not. Um, We're just getting into probably the deepest part of it, which is, of course, at the end. So, you know, like Chance was saying, definitely check that out on Odin's Alchemy. 
Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely very grounding. It's a grounding text. I think, um, I still have some religious scriptures to go through in other cultures just because I think it's fascinating and we should know people, uh, and their core and where they came from, uh, whether they live that truth or not is what is to be seen. So I think out of what I have read, you know, granted that it hasn't been much, it does stand out. Um, these, these things do stand out, simple truths, um, many of which are universal, but sometimes it does take a certain poetry to understand it and to really get to you. Um, there's a reason that, you know, out of all the descriptions for it, uh, mead comes up, Odin goes to get the mead of poetry, uh, you know, Bridget, who I really like, not St. Bridget, um, Brigantia, she's the goddess of poetry. You know, there's a reason that, you know, these, these ancient ancestors of ours use that term because it is, you know, like you were saying, we can find all the syncretism, but what a culture really is, is poetry of consciousness. And it's, it's the essence of life. It's really beautiful. So yeah, just excited to to hear what you thought about it and um, which passages kind of stuck out to you because um, they're they're just they're interesting. Um, it's very interesting also to see what Viking culture is in this day and age and how it seems to completely clash with uh, some things that you read in the Havamal. It's it's amusing and a little sad. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just comment there. Um, definitely found it interesting, the references to the Odin and the Mead of Poetry. It gave me definite, you know, reason to <laughs> suspect, as I do, that he is syncretizable in many ways with other char or other uh, word of God type characters. You know, who he, him uh, getting the runes from the hanging himself, sacrificing himself to himself, but also all this bit about the meat of poetry, there are versions of the logos or the, the word that are also really into wine <laughs> and revelry. You know, that's definitely a theme. So to link those two things together seems appropriate. I mean, and even without syncretism, like the, any culture that probably has those things would realize that it loosens mead loosens the tongue you know and gets you flowing with your words more uh there's a lot to do with flow and rivers in the uh, language of the havamal that doesn't necessarily jump out at you unless you're kind of looking at the way that these um and i only was able to take a little examination but the way that certain words sound like and pun with each other in the actual old norse and i found that very interesting as well being that I just gave the allusion to Bacchus, there's other allusions to a, to rivers and, and memory, <laughs> and with you know in regards to drinking in this uh, poem. So I'm I'm interested in all that, and also just the name Javi for Odin, that is uh, said in the translation I read to possibly derive from Har H A R, which would be totally appropriate in my eyes. Granted that. Uh, Hare is savior and Har would be high one in Norse. Hare in like the Buddhist and and honestly, like all the Indo proto-Indo-European languages that H-A-R could easily and often refer to savior. And in some respects, Odin does fill that role as you know, the best possible fate you can get is to wind up with him, the uh, Valfather in Valhalla, right? Uh, my cat got jealous of yours. No, on my lap. <laughs> yes, yes. Now we're having a cat fest. Oh um, no! I don't know where the cat is. So, what what Rachel <laughs> what Rachel and I got have got had going on is most people give the Havamal a very cursory read. It is an actual very uh, short read. When if you don't take time to put thought into it. You can really just kind of zip right through it. Uh, then on the flip side, if you stop to put thought to it, especially coming from people that lived the way that they did, 
who didn't have internet where they could every 10 seconds flick to something new where you couldn't didn't look at your youtube watch rate and half the time it's under two minutes you know for most people uh and they flick to something else like these people contemplated and put deep meaning into things and i believe rachel and i have really taken the time to also do so um and then also we're reading multiple versions of the havamal because it is a translation and it, honestly, as far as I'm concerned, it, it's uh, the same idea as digging up some creature you've never seen and making up the sound that it makes. You know, they how these people think that they could with any accuracy translate something that uh, it wasn't just too many years ago that it was said that the heathen uh, society did not have a written language. And now it's fairly and now here in just the last couple of years, it's becoming widely accepted that they left stones all over the place with little stories on them and everything. They had a, a written and they language. did a lot of writing on sticks, which would not survive yeah. long, not survive at all. Um, so that these people think that they, they could make this up with, you know, definitive understanding of what is going on. I, I don't see that. So as Rachel and I are going through the different translations uh, these different variations on what's been said a lot of times have a real deep impact on how you understand the story, on what type of emotion it gives you, what type of uh, uh, situation, you know, you're like, oh, this guy's doing good, this guy's doing bad. Uh, all those things, it's no different than like uh, if you watch National Geographic and in one time a mother cooter is feeding her baby and her babies are starving and she has to catch this meal and everything's good and then they flip it around and it's the the meal that's getting caught oh my god it's gonna kill me you know and it's it's real easy depending on who's presenting the story to put that flavor on it so we've examined a number of them um and i find that really important because for myself personally uh I had for years and years not taken any uh, particular theology as my own. And I had just firmly seated myself as left-hand path, which is, uh, I know there's a lot of different heavy uh, thoughts on that for most people. But for me, it just means that uh, right hand is people that are in a religion, that they have rules and texts. And this is how, this is what you do. This, this is how you think. Uh, you know, you go to the church on set on Wednesdays and Sundays and you give this much and you you kneel and stand and sit and kneel and stand and sit and bow your head and lift your head and say whatever they want you to say. And 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 uh, that's that's not my that's not my side of things. Uh, I'm I'm very lab oriented, as Chance talked about at the beginning, where I want to go in and the things that I am looking at, I need to prove them in the lab. And so the philosophies, the, the best philosophies in the world were all derived from alchemy. And that was done in the laboratory as these ancient alchemists sat in the laboratory and watched the way nature worked and watched it over and over and over. And from that started looking at the wider world and seeing that same pattern through pattern recognition that oh, wow, this thing in the laboratory happens here, it happens here, it happens here. Oh, my goodness, it happens everywhere. And so, uh, hi, Michelle. Um, so these philosophies were derived from those understandings, understandings garnered in the lab. And uh, so that's where I take myself and try and put it through. Because in, today, in our, in our uh, today's world, everything's been filtered through somebody else and all the real understandings are lost. So I went back and try to re recreate them for myself and try and get, gain those understandings myself. And so it was a lot of years before uh, I came to Odinism and I was, uh, had been and studied almost every cosmology I can, I can think of. Um, with the exception of some African ones that I haven't gotten to either. Uh, 
and I just happened to go on to uh, started looking at Northern European and I picked up the Havamal. And when I read the Havamal, I was literally like through, through the majority of it. I was like, wow, did I write this? Like, this is just how you live. Um, what I like too is just so it's uh it's so to the point. It doesn't waste words very, you know. I mean, there yeah. are some more cryptic phrasings in there, but again, it's uh 160 stanzas. So overall, you know, not uh overly verbose for a code of rules to live by. Uh, absolutely. And and it, it's it's some of the things I had to put put myself more heavily into is just how heavily it pushes um and it's because i'm not from that era but it pushed more of the host right uh, the host rights and the guest rights and uh where back then and i see it now especially living where i do now where there's situations like just recently we had like five feet of snow at my place people were stuck everywhere having all kinds of problems if somebody showed up at my door, they could die. If you do not take them in, do not take care of them. Uh, that's And that's the situations that they faced back then. So it was very important for you to treat people a certain way and to be a good host to people that came to your door. Um, I think the reason so, why there would be a lot of that is because like living in a more natural law type of society, you don't need pages and pages and chapters and chapters of rules right really yeah. it's just like you're free to do almost anything you can imagine in life because almost anything you could imagine would be fine to do hurt nobody so you really just got to line out a few things that you shouldn't do <laughs> you know it's more about like don't do this and there's not that many of those and anyway i like that and so that's why you'd see a lot about hospitality rules because it's maybe not as um in readily obvious to somebody to have such a strict code without society building up that expectation. But once you had it, you know, a high trust society is a productive and healthy society. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I think what, what people forget when they read things like the Bible is that that particular portion of Israel was being set up to be a priest nation. And like, let that sink in for a minute a priest nation that's why they all circumscribed themselves or um circumcised themselves it was to pass off the idea that they were priestly I you mean, know before it wasn't yeah. popular for just anybody to get a you know their dick clipped it was like just the priest would do it well <laughs> and then that yeah. was their that was literally like their mask like i promise i'm i'm priestly check my you know let me pull my pants down <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's why you see so many do's and don'ts, you know, and so it's fascinating to me. I think in another stream pretty recently, um, somebody in the chat had popped in like, well, here's what the Bible says about magicians. And I, was, and I, I didn't re respond, but this is the thought that came through my head. I'm like, hold on. Yes, it does say that, but I'm not under that law. <laughs> I I mean, first of all, I understand why it says that. I do. I do get it as somebody who goes through my own practices. And and the things that draw me to the Havamal are in relation to my ancestry. You know, that's how I got started to, you know, getting into this stuff. I want to know my ancient ancestors' beliefs, not not just the Christian lineage that I have. But I mean, you, so that means experiencing magic, experiencing these things. And no, I didn't read John Dee and Crowley and all these people who, who set these rules, you know, things by the Golden Dawn, stuff like that. No, because it's, it's for me to experience and to know the truth. So, so that's the thing. It's like, okay, so having experienced what it's like to be under so many rules, laws, and regulations, there are certain lifestyles that, okay, I understand why that's in place. I understand why that's in place. I understand why, you know, we have rules and laws extending outside of being a priest class and, you know, in society because our populations are so massive. They require management, like it or not. They do. So, you know, what I do love about this Havamal is it, it can very easily translate. The hospitality is, is serious. I mean, think about being in the North where it's freezing. 
you start being a jerk to people, they're not going to let you in. When you when you really get get to you know that point, and you kind of got to push it. <laughs> like, I mean, there's so many times in the Havamal where, you know, it says, "You don't know what's going to happen. Just be ready for anything. Defend yourself." You know, fair. He's still saying, still help them. Still, you know. So it would take a lot for you to not receive help. Think about that. <laughs> Oh, but, yeah. Can I read a line here? Please. You know, something that I really liked about the idea of the hospitality. Maybe it's because, uh, you know, if you ran a psychological profile on me, I'm more of a spender than a saver. But there's this line, and I don't recall the translator. So, you know, if this sounds a little different to anyone else who's read it, there's a lot of translations. Uh, this line goes, of his wealth, when he has acquired it, a man shouldn't endure need. One often saves for the loathed what's meant for the loved. Many things turn out worse than one expects. With weapons and apparel, friends should gladden each other. That's most evident on themselves. Givers in return and repeat givers are friends longest, if, if it lasts long enough to turn out well. So I really like that because what I took from that, and maybe you guys have an interpretation as well, but that... People are saving for like, what if something bad happens? I need to save money for that. And so they're saving for what they loathe, which is disaster, rather than uh, <laughs> what's meant for the loved, which is wealth is meant to share with those you love. And if everybody lived that way, then, you know, there would also be probably a much higher likelihood that if the disaster came, someone would have your back rather than it being a big deal that you didn't save, you know? So this is a, I've got a really excellent situation to describe this particular passage right now. Most people do not realize that when they're on state Medicare or Medicaid, that if you go and have a whole bunch of surgery in the state and things like that, get a whole bunch of care, you get cancer treatment, whatever, the state comes back and they get their money back when you die. So whatever was left in your estate, then uh, whatever was in your estate, they get first dibs on. If you owned a property and you think that is passing on to your loved ones, you saved and you did all this and you have all this huge estate that you get to pass on to your loved ones. And this is what it's referring to. Then uh, all of a sudden at the end, the fucking state gets it anyways, like this whole time. And, and you find, you end up finding that out that if you do this kind of thing, uh, the, the, have them all as opposed to the Christian Bible and the, the Christian, the Christian I, I, ideals have slipped into it um, where they've made Loki into almost a devil. But the only bad guy in uh, only really bad uh, character in the heathen stories is Golvig and her sisters who there's very, very little mention of, but that's because there's only fragments of these things. Um, so Golvig is this idea of a hoard of money, this idea of money being worth more than a man. The, the whole story revolved around Odin. Uh, Loki had killed this man's son. And as repayment, Odin offered this hoard of a dragons. And so anytime you have these hoarding ideas, you'll find that uh, uh, in heathen cosmology that that's going to get turn into bad situations you're all of a sudden uh it's no different than the story of the what, what was that the uh the giant pearl i can't remember the name of the story but we all got read that in elementary school where the guy finds the giant pearl and oh yay and now all of a sudden he's got like a million enemies that are all trying to kill him and you know they kill his wife and kids and now all of a sudden uh the world's horrible and he ends up throwing that pearl right back in the fucking ocean like it's the same concept. So if you rather than take your things and anything you earn and live well, like we don't, I know that we don't live visually great, but we eat like Kings here. Like we live really well. When, when we want something like that, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, if it's the $7 for a little tiny thing, of cream, that's the kind we use. Cause that's what we like. And we could save the money and do something else. And then the government's going to come steal it anyways. Currently, 
uh, up in this area, they find any or you any pay for way it later to... by eating cheap food. You pay for it later with yeah. Uh, loss of yeah health. yeah i learned that yeah, a long time ago early in my adulthood to buy higher quality food because then my you know what i'm used to spending on food would be the high quality so eventually and didn't even take long it didn't seem like i was spending a lot on food that's just what food costs to get real food yep. and the other stuff not food you know 100%. if it won't flow to you it won't flow if it won't flow through you it won't flow to you that was but a great you, comment here. That's a perfect chat. example, Chance, because you may have noticed that the universe responded to that action. I watched it happen in reverse. One time I got this idea. I was like, what would happen if I didn't have any money? And then watched myself make less money for, and it didn't even make sense because nothing in my situation changed. Nothing, literally. My boss didn't tell me you were demoting you. Like literally nothing changed. I was like, how do I not have a paycheck? How is this not going anywhere? So you watched it on the flip side, but that's, I'm always going to test those things. <laughs> but that's exactly what happens and why, you know, people who are like, well, I can't afford this. I can't afford this. Trust me, God hears you. <laughs> when you. When you start taking those steps and you start saying, this is for me and investing in yourself and your body, then yes, you will have exactly how much money you need. It won't even make sense that you have it. You will just suddenly find that you've got the budget for it. And because it's not a, an area of stress, it, it won't be. You won't worry about it. Your money will be directed exactly to the place it needs to go. And Ben, I like what you were saying about goal vague and this, this obsession idea. Um, I don't remember where I heard this and let me know if this is incorrect, but it was my understanding that when somebody died uh, in the North, their, all of their possessions and everything was split into three. So a third went to the party and the funeral and everybody helping. Um, a third of it went to family, right? People's inheritance, everyone you love, not necessarily people you don't like. <laughs> but then a third of it was utterly destroyed, utterly and completely trashed and destroyed you know, we're finding all these hordes of gold. Well, maybe they're not hordes. Maybe that was supposed to go back. Um, you know, they call them a hoard and a stash, but it's like, why would you put something in water where it's going to disintegrate? Let's get real. But <laughs> so, but there's that idea. And I told this to somebody who worked with uh, billionaires and he was so confused. He's like, why would you do that? I'm like, think about it though. Think about it on that scale. What if you were a billionaire and you acted that way? First of all, no one's going to be jealous and come after your money because it's gone. Second of all, everyone who needs it will have it. And then you can have the kind of send off you want to have. And then your legacy will be remembered. It doesn't you don't try to keep it going by trying to keep it going. It keeps going because you you write the last page. You know, you're like, all right, it's done. You know, you read somebody's journal from ages ago, their legacy lives on because that's the only addition there is. Why do you think Firefly is still a very popular show? There's only one season. <laughs> so, you know, it's that same thing. Yeah, what uh, what we're talking about here can be found in other religions as well, but that poverty is a consciousness, really, more than anything. Um, <laughs> not like a reality. Obviously, every animal out in nature is completely impoverished monetarily. <laughs> I actually get a lot out of the New Testament on this idea. And, you know, these things pair together well. If you take the what's best from all of them and what resonates, I mean, you get some great philosophy. So to add to this in the New Testament, there's, I don't remember which book, maybe it's in Matthew, I want to say, where basically Jesus is like, uh, why would you be worried about whether or not you're going to survive or have enough? Don't you see the, those birds? Don't you see, you know, those animals are, do, uh, does God not provide everything that they need all the time? What makes you think you're different than them? What makes you think you're so special that you wouldn't be provided for? <laughs> like, it's just, duh. And that's how I feel. And I try to preach to people that what, it, like any of every other life form, whatever you need will be present in the environment that you exist in. Because you and the environment are a continuum. It produced you and you exist within it. And so what you need will be there. But like when this mindset of I can't, I don't have enough or do it for me or, you know, all these different things that are so inculcated by 
big daddy, big mommy government that want to create that sense of dependency, which is enslavement, uh, then of course you're not going to take the actions you need to capitalize on the opportunities to acquire what is in the environment for you. But I really like this society of the the Norse with their hospitality because that environment, you know, <laughs> what I just said might not hold up so well <laughs> at certain times of year, but they provide the you know what they're the environment for one another to make that come true that what you need will always be there just go knock on the door sit on the firewood and wait to be called into the hall you know well one of the things that i would like to add is a caveat because a lot of people end up just taking that very simply with the uh, christian and without putting higher thought into it so birds and other animals don't just willy-nilly not worry about it if a chipmunk lives in an area that's going to have snow and it's going to not be able to dig through the snow to get food, it goes and stashes the fuck out of some food and it just lives. If a, if a woodpecker uh, lives in same said area, they go and drill a bunch of nuts into trees. They do the same damn thing all over the place. Bears go and take and eat all their food and go hibernate. They just because you're not worried about things doesn't mean you don't act in accordance is what I'm saying. Yeah. The action is the demonstration of the faith. Yes. So even though I, I don't, I'm not scared. I'm not going to freeze next winter. I'm also going to spend this summer stacking up firewood and putting away firewood. So that way I don't fucking freeze next winter. It's, it's, you know, so many people like to twist some of these things into that, uh, Love the whole reason attraction. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm against communes anymore is because 99% of the people in that commune want to just be there to just have the love, man, everything, nature provides everything. No nature provided you with the backbone to go out and do some damn work to provide for yourself. Quit laying the fuck around waiting for other people to feed you. Like, and that's what you get 99% of in the commune. And that's why I won't live that way in a heathen community. You wouldn't be allowed to do that. It was really more of, uh, individualists that live together. So there was a, a very loose, very loose, uh, community structure. And then everybody was expected to not kill your neighbors don't steal from your neighbors don't rape your neighbors nobody likes this shit like you know real loose structure uh the the jarl would have a good idea and then everybody else would discuss it and if you didn't want no part of it you didn't have no part of it like you also didn't reap the reward or pay the penalty of said thing. So it, that's entirely on you. If it sounded like a good idea and you thought it was a good risk reward scenario, you jumped in on it. But all these things were very, very individual. And it wasn't so uh, where like our community today, where we have a top down authority, uh, the top down religion. Uh, your relationship with Odin was expected to be something felt through nature in your home. It wasn't something that a priest gave you. Yeah, going back to that experiential side of things, you know, it's it's one thing to have complete faith in in God, but that's, you know, when people talk about having a relationship with God, you it's not always just sitting down. I mean, sometimes it is sitting down and, and talking, um, but it's not always just reading. That's like, to me, that always seemed like reading a bunch of love letters and just being in that state all the time. You know, it's like, this is very nice, but when do we hang out? <laughs> when are we going to, you know, go do stuff? You know, so sometimes, you know, you build the relationship by, <clears throat> excuse me, interacting with nature interacting with the world that <clears throat> is the very expression just as much as you are. I like all that. Yeah. I mean, I personally 
enjoy, like, I, I feel a lot of connection spiritually from the mystery that you can get in the books, but it, it's worthless if you have no connection to the actual natural world, what does nothing for you. It's just sort of like mental masturbation. But if you have that mystic framework and that mathematical, you know, Marty leads <laughs> type of magic in your toolkit, and then you go out into nature, it actually will help you become more of like a Kyle Denton, typical new herbs type where, because you sort of know this mystical framework that the fractal runs on, then you can see a plant and it starts talking to you. And it's like, this is what I want to help you with. And so there's like a, that's, that's sort of the mind and the the heart path merging. And that's what an awesome birthright we have as beings on this realm. Like how, uh, one thing I really like of the old Norse mythology, morality, is that <laughs> nobody's come around and tried to like turn it into some kind of pop culture Gnostic simulation theory bullshit. <laughs> like <laughs> there's there's nothing victimy about it. There's like no there's literally no room for anyone to interpret it in such an ultimate victim way. So, you know, what do you what are your thoughts on all that? I abs oh go ahead, Rachel. Oh no. <laughs> I was just gonna agree. <laughs> That's what I like about yeah, it. No, I have not a lot of room for that. <laughs> no, it's a very self-accountable situation. And I don't know if uh, Christianity was originally meant to, to do that. But that's one of my biggest, where I find its biggest flaw, is when you pin your worth on another person, you take away all of your accountability. And that's why, you know, everything they do is up to God and blah, blah. We, I can't do anything. I'm worthless, you know, and it, it's a horrible, horrible, disempowering situation. They were they were born horrible and they will never be anything but horrible. And and the only reason that they can get into the backstage is because they made friends with the cool kid and kissed his feet like that that's such a defeatist defeatist thing it's like that's you know i really understand where the the old catholic self-flagellation where they whip themselves and shit bleeding like i get it you are basically spiritually doing that to yourself wow even the people that you know born with I mean, the, just what you described is, is probably why fetishes sexually is the same word phonetically as a fetish which is basically when a, a culture uh, misunderstands their ancestor symbols and makes them into idols, you know, fetish with the CH fetish with an SH same basically thing. And yeah, it's like who can suffer hardest for dad. It's so weird. Well, and, and here's yeah, something that I, I like this terminology that I learned um, through the gene keys. Um, and this falls very much into the, the Pisces season type of idea too, is there, it swings both the pendulum swings both ways with this idea. You know, you have on one hand, the martyr, and then on the other side, you've got, I'm so awesome because you do have plenty of people now in modern Christianity who understand their divine heritage, which is great. I love that. Please keep doing that, but not to the point where you say, Oh, I'm, I don't have to take responsibility. I could just give it all to Jesus. And it's like, but that's a private minute between you and God. How are you acting between you and me? Because that's what needs to change. You know, if, if great that you're forgiven, great that there's grace for you. I love that. You're not above being a better person. You're not above apologizing. You're not above some responsibility and taking things up upon yourself. If you're going to sit here and tell me I can do all things through Christ, let me see you do them. You know, if he's going to sit there and encourage you and, you know, you're going to let him drive or whatever, you better be navigating really hardcore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if I want to take a road trip with you, man. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> that type of thing, but it, it definitely goes both ways. And, and I think in this, in this particular set of, I wouldn't even call it anything but advice. It's just some very candid advice. Um, it's It leaves a lot of room for you to make decisions on your own. You know, it reads like, here's how I how I figured it. And here's what I'm going to tell you. You know, don't do this. 
but it's not like a you shall not it's more like hey man i learned <laughs> it's it feels that way to me you know it's just especially when he talks party. about drinking yeah especially when he talks about drinking yes. like hey you know i did that i drank too much and i woke up in the lair of a dickhead and uh, there was nothing i could do about it i was fully in his control and uh, that's all because i got drunk uh yeah um uh you know i want to comment on that that part of the havamal actually because again to draw the comparison to odin and other versions of the logos that have a lot of revelry in embedded in their mythos like bacchus or even saturn with the whole saturnalia festival uh <laughs> odin is said to dr live on wine alone you know, that sounds very Bachian or Dionysian. Absolutely. And in the Havamal, they they make a comparison of drink to the heron, like the bird, the heron. And I found that pretty interesting because this was right around while they're, while they're making like allusions to it causing forgetfulness, you know, drunkenness causing forgetfulness. And the uh, river that one crosses with Charon is the river of forgetfulness, which is like philologically Heron, like the bird and Charon, the ferryman, same word, because some, you know, you go translate a word from one language to another, the H could easily become a CH. A lot of places aspirate <laughs> instead of huh, and some places just drop the leading H altogether. So Aaron, Charon, you know, Heron, <laughs> and in the same place, they uh, they make a pun on the idea of forgetfulness. Om Amini, O M I N N I, with the Armini, A R M I N N I. So Omini is forgetfulness. Armini is a river, a river's mouth or an estuary. So you know they're making this allusion to forgetfulness and the river, and Odin's the one talking about it. And I'm like. Is this guy, you know, he's living on wine. He's the god of poetry and and the ruins. Is he also, in a way, is this like a different, not that he is Charon, but like, is this, uh, you know, back to this astro theology of things, are they reading, the Norse people reading the stars and this is what they're getting with the ideas that someone else in a different place came up with Charon and the river sticks. You get, you kind of catch my drift. It's all very interesting. Yeah. Um. That would be really interesting. I mean, Bach, to know. In Bacchus, Bach means stream in German. You know, mm -hmm. and rivers well, and streams. I, I also do want to point out. I also yeah, want to ahead. point out that uh, not all alcohols, not all meads, are meant to get a person drunk. So, as a mead maker, uh, they, there is definitive difference. Uh, I, I understand that today the meads that most people make, they're legitimately trying to get like 15, 16% alcohol, but understand pretty kitty understand that, uh, uh, when Rome and Germany clashed at first, Germany kicked the shit out of Rome and then Rome came back in and where they started ha winning battles is when they started feeding the Germans uh, Roman wine. Because Roman wine had mad punch. We didn't have mad punch in our drinks. So there was a difference between like a mead of knowledge or a mead of poetry and sitting around partying with, with you know, the boys. Uh, and and that kind of gets lost in today's society where we aren't drinking things like uh, uh, more spiritual cocktails or more herbal type cocktails that might inspire things other than drunkenness. Like the idea of drinking and not getting drunk to most people is so fucking foreign. It's not even funny. So I, I so I think that that caveat needs to be overlaid on that, that there is a definitive difference between when he's talking about, I drank too much at a party as opposed to where Odin only lived on drink, which myself, I eat very little. I drink a ton. I understand how that works. And a lot of times you're infusing different essences and things like that into your drink. Um, maybe he's just got beyond taking in the carbon body of things. Well, I think oh, it also could be too. kind of, uh, and I want to, I want to hear Rachel's point for sure. And I'll just throw in that. I think this could also be related to 
you know, Odin's called Thunderer at least once in the Havamal. And another Thunderer is Indra, who steals Ambrosia from the gods for immortality. I think that's a very similar thing to Odin stealing the, the mead of poetry. You know, mm -hmm. granted that they're both storm gods. Yeah, absolutely. And he can act kind of like a storm, um, being unpredictable and swift. So there is a lot there. Um, but I do want to throw this out there. Um, because he was going through and looking for knowledge and and wisdom, that is absolutely what he gets through this mead. You know, it's like Ben was saying there, it is very different. Yes, I saw the comments, you know, wine wasn't something that was grown up there. But also, I mean, you do have different potencies. You do have different effects. That's why I loved listening to Kyle last night uh, from Tippecanoe, because, you know, when you engage with certain different plants, you are engaging with a plant deity. And some people work very heavily and seriously with them on that level. So that's a thing. But also, if we look at... Um, Yes, I want that. Um, if we look at Loki as being part of Odin, you know, he's talking about, hey, I got really wasted and here's why it sucked. Because what did Loki start doing when they all got together? You suck, you suck, you suck, you suck, and here's why. Odin's ravens are thought and memory. He's not drinking and forgetting. He's drinking and remembering. Hey, remember when you did this? Hey, remember when you did that? Oh, no, not, let's not leave you out. You're a piece of garbage, you know. Nobody likes that. If you're going to like <laughs> forgive it and let it go, then you got to let it go. <laughs> so that's another reason why he's like, maybe don't do that. Maybe don't. <laughs> There's another comment saying, you know, talking about Odin is a cool kid. Um, like, meads can not. be with grapes. <laughs> meads can be with grapes. Uh, that's part of why they were super excited when they found Vinland. Uh, that's why they called this country Vinland. Uh, the difference between a mead and a wine is a mead is fermented with honey and a wine is fermented with sugar. Uh, and then sometimes you can do different uh, uh, meads without your honey in it even. Uh, and occasionally I use maple syrup, uh, like a real raw maple syrup. That's, mo that's most excellent. But you're using a much more uh, natural sugar as opposed to a refined sugar. And meads take closer to you can do things to make it faster but you really a mead needs to ferment for at least a year uh, uh honey's a very complex sugar uh it's a very slow ferment um as opposed to wine which definitely gets uh but probably last uh, longer oh yeah well and the thing the other thing about mead is is let's say we live up in the frigid north where food is only able to grow three, four months a year. So you maximize the amount of food during that time. You harvest all of it. Well, now how do you store it? They don't have the the refrigeration during the fall that we have. The Anything that comes ripe off the vine, that stuff goes bad right now. So what you do is you make it into a nice mead. And now you can sit it on the shelf for the next five years and it only gets better and better. Uh, so, and you've unlocked a bunch of nutrients that you didn't, that weren't even bioavailable to you th through that. So while you're sitting around sipping your, sipping your dinner, right. You know, all, all year until you're able to pick food again next year. So people forget that before. So the when first you share hour, half of your mead bowl with a, a visitor, that's like a, <laughs> you know, you're yeah. giving them calories, you know, that's more valuable 100%. than gold in a lot of cases. Um, I want to, you know, and I'll Before just, the I, there's a, a thread I want to get into though, or at least a, a question that I want to get into with you guys, but I have to respond to your comment here in the chat, Rachel Boudica warned specifically against Roman wine and bread. You know, when it's interesting that, uh, Boudica has a name that, you know, I don't know enough to say for sure if I think that that's a r real historical character or a mythological character or one that's had the lines blurred between, um, you know, and some of, some of both, but her name sounds a lot like B Buddha, right? And Buddhism, as far as I can figure, is the oldest culture that, or the the first culture and the, that gave about the idea of like bread and wine as the sacrament or as the sacrifice that they, 
you know, they didn't want to sacrifice animals. They actually, a lot of the old Buddhism didn't allow or prescribed against, I should say, said you shouldn't do it. I don't think they enforced it, but that you shouldn't kill animals. And so they started up the sacrifice of bread and wine <laughs> and the Romish church or the, I'm sorry, the Christian church, Romish I've been reading old books, but <laughs> they, you know, they model a lot of things off of, or whatever Buddhism, you know, came from maybe R Rome isn't directly modeled off of Buddhism, but you know, there seems to be some common origin point to all this stuff. And so whenever like where I'm going with this is that when Odin it said that he lives on wine alone. Well, that's probably an epithet or a descriptor or kenning. I don't know which one of his it would be <laughs> about Odin that maybe was written by a monkish, a Latin monkish guy, you know, not really necessarily from within the tradition. So when he's talking about wine, that's from his worldview, his language, his experience. Yeah. Wine's not maybe as common in, uh, to the northerners at all uh, that they would even know about it or use that word but my point being that um you know i came across this this really really fantastic quote from godfrey higgins in anacalypsis and he says you know there may be a little explaining to do with this but he says i have no doubt generally ancient names had a meaning particularly technical terms or terms of art so terms of art is like what you would call jargon, the way that doctors can talk to each other and it sounds like they're speaking a different language or lawyers especially. That's terms of art. And in fact, technology, the concept of technology before it was applied to consumer home electronics and whatnot actually meant terms of art. If you go look up the 1828 definition of technology, that's what it's referring to. So, you know, when we see things like Odin who lives on wine alone or any of the other names like Valfather or tons of other names that are given as alternate names for Odin or the translators like, I don't know, I think this is referring to Odin. He's got a million names or like Marduk with 50 names and all these gods have all these titles and all these descriptors. And so what do you think about that having to do with terms of art or that in a sense, the, the priesthood, the, the vulvas, whoever it is, whatever culture, uh, priests or priestesses, <laughs> they're like able to communicate with each other in code, procedures, histories, who knows what, like the way that lawyers speak in legalese type jargon to each other and we can't even understand it. Like, do you think there's some element of alchemy or other forms of wisdom encoded in a lot of these, you know, uh, epithets and, and descriptors and titles? I, I think that technologically uh, speaking, like, is there a technology to it? So I think that no matter what skill field you go into, no matter how low in your mind that field is, I don't care if it is the grocery bagger down the road, there's weird little terms that that grocery bagger uses at his work every day that when he says them to other people, that means some shit to them. And they will go and apply that same thing that you just said. Uh, something like simple, like the word dyke. It could either be an offensive slur to, to uh, a lesbian. That's today's term. Or when I was young, that wasn't even a thing. That was literally a, a piece of a waterway in a dam that were on the spillway. Or you could have a door dyke on a fridge or any one of, depending on which field you are in, that entire word means something entirely different. So I don't think that uh, alchemists or doctors or lawyers having weird little words that they say is something that's like some evil, like, oh, no, it comes from guilds. It comes from guilds that were protecting trade secrets, I think. Well, and, secret, and it's just but the nature of when you develop too. far into a certain pursuit that, you know, you're going to have to come up with new ways of describing things that are going to be unfamiliar to someone without the vernacular. Sure, sure. But, I mean, and that's, I think it's kind of relative to say what's a secret and what's not and why a thing is kept secret and why something is, you know, I mean, it's like you were saying, Ben, you know, it doesn't matter who it is, they're going to have terms that they use. And it's not that what they're doing is secretive at all but it helps them do things much more quickly 
So we could see it and be like, what are they really talking about? He's like, I was just talking about grabbing those tomatoes, you know? So, <laughs> you know, it's like, and maybe, maybe the things that we think are secret are, are that way for a reason. So much of it's experiential. Um, it kind of ties into, I, I did want to get to this question because I think it's perfect. Thank you, Shannon, um, about the other worlds. And, and so, you know, there might not, may or may not be a lot of text on it, <clears throat> but what I'm seeing a lot of modern practitioners mention is if you want to go there, then you need to go there. You know, it's, it's experiential. It's not that there's a secret about it and you might go there and be like, oh my God, that's not somewhere we should all be trying to go. And you'll know why people haven't been able to experience that or why some people can experience it a lot. It It is so specific to who you are and your understanding of anything, especially in art. You know, I know if I am with anyone are, who Are you saying school, though that like the Bifrost Bridge is your own chakra system and the nine realms are realms within when you say go there you're talking about like inner journeys like in a shamanic sense yes and no absolutely yes and no because i think that you actually could physically go there um that's just my opinion it's not something i've tried because there are other places i'd like to go but <laughs> you, yes, you could first. absolutely do it internally you absolutely could see it that way and go through and go to the nine worlds within the self 100% I think you can do that. But do I also think as that above, it's- As above, so below. As above, so below. So is there another, um, this is another term that's been thrown around, um, assemblage point. Only a few people will know what that is. If your assemblage point is shifted to somewhere else, your body will follow. So in the Bible, when it talks about Elijah walking into heaven, his assemblage point shifted to the point where his physical self went somewhere else into a different part of the 3D realm that we are not experiencing. And that's, so yes, it's yes and on that. And there are, you know, I so agree, experience agree. it yourself and try it, you know, but be, be extra cautious, be very real. Um, understand that, you know, if it's not somewhere that you're meant or called to be, you might not go there for all the trying in the world. And that's that's okay. That's gonna have to be okay. <laughs> we're fract we're fractals of the world. We work the way the world works, the way the world's put together, we're put together. And and so if it has nine realms external, we, there's nine realms internal is also as within, so without. Straight up. Yeah. <laughs> Before the first hour think runs think up. The inner travel version would be the easiest way. <laughs> <laughs> to have an experience no doubt well it would definitely be easier uh less time consuming one would think uh before the first hour runs up though i wanted to address uh so uh with heathens specifically there isn't a judge when i die i'm the judge and like, I think Egyptians that same way too, when they say your heart needs to be lighter than a feather, that to me means where do you think you were a good person or do you think you were a shit bag? And that's, who's going to judge in the end is you, you were the one that went through this. Did I try to be a good person who tried to make those around me feel better, live better, have a better experience? and it, was that just my general being? Well, damn right I have a heart lighter than a feather. Like, of course I deserve to be up here. I deserve to go to the next level. I did good. That's all going to be determined by me, though. And at the same time, that makes me live a very certain way here. Because if I feel like I was a shitbag about something... I will eat myself up over it. And so this is part of why I carry myself like such a hard ass because I don't like messing up. It's it's not something I do. And <clears throat> I try my best to avoid it. I live very, very much by my moral code. Well, uh, there's another good question in the chat. What are Rachel's and Ben's definition of heathen? Probably, uh, probably pretty basic, uh, as in what the actual word means. 
<laughs> That's probably my definition. Does it mean countryside person? Yes. There you go. That's what that means. <laughs> I like Living it. with the land. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah. And you know, if you go back to the <laughs> meaning of Christian before it was uh, sort of corporatized, if you will, Krestos in Greek means good. So before it was, you know, started being written with an I rather than an E, a Christian in the Greek wouldn't be a good person, good man, good woman. <laughs> so, you know, we can actually be heathens in the countryside living with nature and good men and women. So you can be a heathen and a Christian Christian <laughs> at the same time, you know, depending on how you look at those terms and whether or not you need some kind of like special boy uh, denominational badge to feel like you're in the right club. Or if you just are like Botherson's talking about, able to sense the moral structure built into this universe. What you were saying about the nine realms within, you know, if you apply that to the fact that we're all born with a conscience that can feel when something is morally right or wrong, well, that means, you know, if you really truly see and experience and thus accept the as within, so without nature of universe, then that means this whole place has a morality built into it. That there is an energy that either constricts or flows based on morality and moral behavior. And there's no getting away from that. <laughs> you know, that's, re that's the capital R reality that no theology or dogma needed to be able to be aware of. If you can tell that the outer world and inner world are a reflection to each other, then your conscience yeah. exists in everything, not yours per se, but like, you know, the, whatever it is that gave you yours, maybe is another way of putting it. So heathen, as Rachel pointed out, is a country person or a, a mountain person. And specifically the, the theology is based around that. That's part of why there's such a heavy guest rice and host, right? Um, so Odin in that is very specific in telling you that if you want to be a happy man, you get a small farm, even if it's only a shack and a couple goats, and you go live on it. That's how you live well. It doesn't matter if it's a shack and a couple goats. And that's so that's the the theology is built for that type of person, that very super independent, uh, self-reliant type of person who, you know, uh, like myself recently with these, uh, all these different, uh, the snow, uh, and all these different emergencies, you know, I'm gruff and I'm, and you know, some people find me a little bit unapproachable occasionally, and I expect things to be a certain way, but on the same token, I'm the first person that's going to be there to help. And I will be there to help and break and break my back to make sure things come out good. And then I might cut, cuss around under my breath and then go home because I'm a crotchety old bastard, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we want to uh, ah! the second hour or... Well, I, I'd like you, unless you want to tease it for the second hour, like if you feel that you have a lot to expand on. A little um, bit. Um, <laughs> just in terms of. But I don't want you to lose track of the flow. So why don't we you know. finish those thoughts and then we'll move into the second hour. We have plenty of problem all to talk on on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I just. Well, like so I want to cut. I do want to touch on the nine realms on the other side. So Beautiful. and, and uh, including Heimdall and a bunch of my thoughts on that. Because Heimdall sits at the rainbow top of the rainbow bridge, and he's the shining white one. So let's go. But go ahead, Rachel. But that was your the second hour teaser. Oh yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, yeah, I would love to dive more into Havamal because it is so personal. Uh, but one thing that I would like to get into is um, regional. Why there are regional gods and things like that versus you know the all one, you know, why that's so important to have these, what that's about and why it's important, I guess. So just to expand a little bit more onto that. Okay. So you're teasing them on that Paganism. one. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'll keep that in my mental post-it note. We're going to talk about an hour or two 
the why for regional gods. I I mean, I could think of some good reasons, but uh, can't wait to hear what you have to say. And, Odin, and then our Odin's Alchemist here is going to talk more about the Nine Realms. And we will also maybe select a few other lines out of the Hava Mall to examine. But uh, it's been, you know, the time just flew by. It's been a great first hour. People listening on YouTube and on Benjamin's YouTube, you can catch us on the Interverse Rockvin channel. The second hour is going to be streaming there. We'll just continue seamlessly after a, about a three-minute intermission. Go get some tea. Go get something to drink. Uh, go to the, you know, take a tinkle, whatever. And then for those of the, those of you out there who are subscribed to my Patreon, you'll be able to catch the second half of the podcast on there once I get it uploaded. But, you know, Rockfin's where we're streaming live and continuing this chat. So I hope to see a bunch of you there. I'm posting it in the live chat right now so you guys can jump on over but you know if you're listening to this later on just check the episode description for links on how to sign up for interverse plus we you know i <laughs> appreciate the support and uh would love to also get you guys into the some tuning sessions they've been very powerful lately also we got a plug before we leave the free people uh Everything Ben wants to plug, everything Rachel wants to plug, and also that you can catch these two on Weaving Spiders webs on YouTube pretty dang regularly. Uh, Baldy's basically taking over. <laughs> He's <laughs> always there. <laughs> uh, so if you guys like uh, this type of thing and all kinds of other far out syncretism, Weaving Spiders webs is a great place to be. You know, now that they're starting earlier, you're probably going to see me in there a lot more too. I, get, I enjoyed it last night. So, yeah, uh, Balderson and Rachel, in that order, please give your plugs, and then we'll mosey on over to hour two. So, everybody, come on over to uh, Odin's or Benjamin Balderson's Odin's Alchemy. I'm on YouTube and on Rockfin. And for those of you already watching on YouTube and Rockfin, well, I'm going to shut this down at the, uh, at the hour right after this is done, and you're going to have to jump on over to Interverse uh, on Chance's Rockfin. So, really easy just swing on over to, to chance gardens rock fin um <clears throat> karen b has successfully uh locked down an event center in vegas so flattoberfest this year is going to be in vegas uh october what is it 21st and 22nd April, october 21st and 22nd um, obviously on the 20th, the Friday, there'll be a little meet and greet type thing again, and everybody be hanging out, uh, and being able to make the connections, which honestly is the best part about doing these big live events is being able to hang out with the like-minded people and, and actually share the energy and, and truly become friends. Uh, uh, there's no letting go of that. You know, when your internet friends disappear, that that's, it sucks. You know, you like them a lot, but when somebody you really know disappears, that's that you're going to keep looking, you know, that's something that just stands on your heart. You die, you chained, you broke bread, but, uh, come on over, check out Odin's alchemy. Everybody come to flat Overfest. It's going to be phenomenal this year. Uh, West coast. Finally, let's, let's get some people there. Uh, Rachel had best be coming or else I will go up there and grab her and Jim and, and hog tie them. Oh, country I'm threaten style. Right now to come. Threatening. Yeah. And <sighs> and I expect to see chance, but chance might yeah, I understand that the bear events are there's uh at least last year it kind of coincided. Hmm. Uh so I do understand other events are coinciding in the same time, but love you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. All right, where do they find you, Miss Maiden? Well, for the most part, I'm on Telegram uh, with my channel Sunforge, and the chat is Refinery. I do host some events. We'll be doing more Full Moon Poetry because backed by popular demand, and it is a lot of fun. So the last one was just a total blast and such a blessing. Love hearing your voices, your thoughts, your, your laughter, and uh, all your creativity. It's wonderful. So thank you for sharing that. But um, I do you know, stuff with Ben. So please check out our streams on Odin's Alchemy. We are still going through the Hava Mall. We'll hopefully finish that up and get to the rest of the Edda. <laughs> We're really wanting to do that because the there's so much more. Um, 
Yeah, and we want to get into some of the the less known books. Yes. But yeah, yeah, we also, due diligence though, due diligence, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we'll get to some of that. Um, I did start up a channel on Odyssey only, uh, just a few casual conversations is what I'm inviting you into. Uh, We have a few talks with Michelle from Healing Home and Beth Martins. And right now I'm going through Women Who Run With Wolves with Rel Truth Seeker. So we're just tackling it one story at a time. Um, One episode's on my channel, one episode's on her channel. So definitely check both of us out on there. So, yeah. Beautiful. All right. Well, uh, I'm excited that you guys can are going to continue your collaborations. I've enjoyed them a lot and, you know, might end up being a future Interverse episode where we can talk about some of these other Eddas because it's uh, there's a lot there. <laughs> there's a lot there. I, I'm, you know, I feel like Norse mythology is a very rewarding system to go through. But we'll see everybody over on the Rockfin side. Thanks for hanging out. I'm going to play you guys Uh, some intermission music and then we will commence into the second half. All right, everyone out there, much love.